they would have all said yes, or almost all everybody would have said yes. They would have said the right to life is more important than the, life, the rights of corporations making a little bit extra profits, especially when you see the data which shows that they aren't using any of this money or using very little of this money to, to invest in, in the kinds of drugs that are relevant to, to poor developing countries, tropical diseases. They're, they're spending far more, far more on advertising, far more on research on lifestyle drugs like uh, making your hair grow than they are on diseases on malaria or the diseases on eggs, the forms of eggs that appear in, 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 in tropical, uh, in Africa and developing countries. So uh, these are all examples of showing the failure of globalization, uh, the democratic deficit which has pushed corporate interests over other values like the environment, over life, and over democracy itself. And that raises the question, what, what has globalization been doing to democracy in the developing world? President Bush has made the spread of democracy one of the major issues. Everybody talks about democracy. But what are we really doing about democracy, particularly within our globalization agenda? Unfortunately, I think that in many ways, the globalization agenda, as it's been managed, has been undermining democracy. It's been doing that in several different ways. First, in effect, it has been giving Wall Street a vote, a voice, in many of the developing countries. Let me give you an example. Not very long ago, Brazil had an election. It's had a number of elections uh, in recent years in which as the various parties have had a debate about this policy or that policy, Wall Street has cast its vote. They've said, if you vote for this guy, we're taking our money out. And just as a word of precaution, we're going to start taking our money out now. And so what they've told the country, if you vote for this guy that we don't like, it's over. And of course the country fears. And the result of that fear is that the Wall, Street wish, Wall Street's wish too often has prevailed. Now it's not been always the case, but the point I'm making is, why should Wall Street have any voice? Why should they have such a large vote? If you open up your markets to short-term capital flows, this is what happens. Now, of course, foreign investors have the right to decide whether to go into a country or not. Foreign investors, long-term investors, those who are going to put plants and equipment, take a long-term view. And their long-term view is exactly what the country wants. They are concerned about long-term growth. But that's not what the bond traders in Wall Street are concerned about. They're not interested in the long-term growth. They're interested in the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And the result of that is that their interests do not coincide with the long-term interest of the country. Sometimes they do, but too often they don't. So, yes, you do need to pay attention to the perspective of those who may want to come and invest, but it should be the long-term investors, not the short-term speculative capital flows. The second way in which democracy has uh, too often been undermined is the whole variety of restraints that international agreements impose on countries. Areas where arguably they should not, there's no need to impose those constraints. For instance, in the bilateral trade agreement between Chile and the United States that was signed just a couple of years ago, the United States forced Chile to agree not only n not to impose any restraints in capital flows. The, Chile had, been, had imposed those restraints in capital flows and those had contributed to stabilizing that country, avoiding some of the worst inflow and outflow that had ravished Latin America and, South e and, and, and East Asia uh, in the late 90s, early uh, years of this uh, century.
United States, as part of the agreement, insisted that they not do that. But they also went so far as to say, you cannot have a special tax on large cars. Large cars pollute more. They cause congestion. They have huge social and environmental costs. And it seems to me perfectly reasonable that countries sh should pose, impose high taxes. But my view is not what's relevant. The real question is, it should be up to the country to decide whether they want to tax large cars. But as a condition of the bilateral agreement, they're not allowed to do that. The reason was very clear. The United States did not, the United States exports large cars. And it wanted to make sure that its ability to export those large cars would not be inhibited by any taxes that Chile might impose. Not discriminatory against America, but just discriminating, as they should, against large gas guzzlers. These are an example of how the sovereignty of countries can be restrained by international agreements. The third way in which democracy is undermined by international institutions has to do with a concept called conditionality. When countries, developing countries, get money from the IMF, the World Bank, these institutions typically impose conditions. A wide range of conditions. You must do this, you must do that. Some of them make sense, some of them don't. But the general point is that in one way or another, they are restraining the ability of the country to do what it wants to do. Now, of course, any lender is going to say, I want to make sure that the money that I've lent you goes to the way you, that you promised to spend it. You promised to build a bridge, I want to make sure the bridge is built. That's reasonable conditionality. But that's not what we're talking about here. In some of the IMF loans, there'd be dozens, in some cases over a hundred conditions that were imposed, many of which had nothing to do with the project involved or the, or the, 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 the particular set of problems facing the country. So the, in, in, effect, in effect, the conditionality that was imposed by the IMF and uh, IMF, uh, World Bank and, and other donors takes up what we call the whole policy space. It really dictates, focuses the attention of the government. And worse, they often give a, a short timeline. The United States and Western Europe have been debating what to do about Social Security for years. And yet, IMF conditionality, World Bank conditionality might say, you have to reform your Social Security system, your pension system within 60 days, 90 days, or 120 days, a timeline that, that is, not consistent with the way normal democratic processes work. So, unfortunately, the way that globalization too often has worked has been to undermine democracy rather than to strengthen it. One of the particular sects of, of interventions, uh, particular sects of, of conditionalities uh, have uh, have to do with uh, a whole set of restrictions on foreign investment. Um, understandable that one wants to protect your foreign investors, but the question is getting the right balance. The kinds of problems that we've seen have been particularly clear in the area of the oil and mineral industries because they highlight the balance of interest between foreigners and the country involved, between the environment, current generations, and future generations. Too often, in the process of taking out valuable natural resources, taking out oil, gas, the environment and the area around gets spoiled. And so the company gets their minerals, the company gets the revenues, the country is left with the problem of dealing with the environment. So we have all kinds of guarantees to make sure that the investments are not expropriated. 
American government, the World Bank, provide insurance for foreign investors against expropriation. But there's nothing protecting, what, protecting the developing countries about against the, the, the international oil companies or resource companies spoiling the environment, destroying the water, spilling oil in the water. When Exxon spilled water in, uh, in, in the Valdez up by Alaska, it caused an enormous amount of damage, billions of dollars of damage. In that case, there was a suit, filed suit against, the, uh, against Exxon. Those suits cost millions and millions and millions of dollars. Alaska could afford it. The United States government could afford it. But if you are a poor developing country, your income is smaller than that of Exxon. It's an unfair balance. Even worse, quite often, the mineral companies, the oil companies will say, if you sue us, we'll, take, we'll, we'll leave and no other investor will come. And if your choice is between your meager income the livelihood of your people and spoiling the environment, which is a problem for some future politician. You go ahead, spoil the environment, take the income. Uh, it's a complete imbalance of power. So what's happened over and over again is that the mineral companies, the oil companies take out the resources, they get the revenue up front, and the country is left dealing with the problems the, the, the devastation behind. An example is Papua New Guinea, uh, a gold mine there, a very rich gold mine, which uh, provided for a while uh, a substantial fraction of the government's revenue. Uh, the company made assurances that it would do only limited damage to the environment and they would take care of it. Well, a few years later on, it became apparent that the environmental damage was enormous beyond what the company was willing to pay. So having taken out the, the, the best uh, part of the, the, the minerals, they just left. And they left the country. They said, oh, you, you can take cake keep whatever gold is left, but you have to pay the cost of cleaning up the, 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 the mess that was left behind, the, 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 mess, the environmental mess that was left behind. The company has no assets in the country, so there's not, even if it wanted to sue, it, can't, it, it would be in a difficult position to sue. So the first problem is that they, they cause this enormous environmental damage, uh, but the problem is that even as they're causing this enormous, enormous environmental damage, which often has enormous health consequences, often the developing countries get a minuscule fraction of the revenues that are generated. The vast majority go to the, uh, the corporation, the international corporation. We've seen this more recently in the case of Bolivia. I was down in Bolivia quite recently talking to the President Morales, uh, talking to many people all over Bolivian society. Uh, there was a general outrage. Many of the foreign gas companies were paying 18% of the value to the Bolivian government. 82% went to the foreign oil companies. What's worse, this was true as the price of energy increased enormously. The agreement was signed when the price of energy, the price of oil was, was, was $20 a barrel. Since then, it's increased by more than threefold. That increase in the threefold increase in the price of, 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 of oil and gas has all been Pure profits to the oil companies. It doesn't take oil and gas companies. It doesn't cost any more 
to extract oil when the price is 70 or 60 than when the price is 20. So their cost of extraction is, is, is the same. And yet they keep 82% of the increase of the price when it went from 20 to 60 or 70. That was pure gravy for them. They were willing to make the investment when the price was 20. <clears throat> they were already doing very well at 20. All the rest of that is pure profit. So while Bolivia was getting almost nothing for these resources, a country that was desperately poor, where large fractions of the population are living below poverty, all the billions of dollars were pouring out of the country to the foreign oil companies. And all that Bolivia said is, we want a fair deal. And they've now demanded a renegotiation of the contract. Now, this is an example where the complexity of, the, of, the, of, of, of arrangements leave enormous scope for various people to give various pictures of what was going on. Bolivia made it very clear that it did not intend to expropriate without compensation. That it wanted the foreign investors there, but it wanted them to get a fair compensation. It did not want them to rob the country of its resources. So it said, yes, you will get compensated for your investment. We, we want you. We want you to stay. And we're willing to actually compensate you quite well. But the resources, the actual resources, belong to the Bolivian people. And they've committed themselves to devoting the revenue that they get to reducing poverty in Bolivia. The constitution of Bolivia said that any sale of this kind had to be ratified by the Congress. And yet the, for, the, the government, the previous government, did not bother to submit it to the Congress. And so at least most of the Bolivians that I talked to had very strongly the view that this was not even a sale. It was not even a question of nationalization because it had never been sold. It had never been privatized legally. It's like somebody who, uh, 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 a married couple owns a house. The husband signs it away, but the wife doesn't sign. Is the house sold? Well, no. You have to get the signature from both of the owners. And in this case, it's very understandable why you want not just the president, but you want the Congress to make sure that the voice of the people have been under, uh, heard. But unfortunately, too often the European press, the American press, did not, did not explain the, what was really going on, that it, the Boliv Bolivia was just asking for a fair share and asking that the law be complied with. Now, another example that shows you uh, uh, what, 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 what it can happen is Venezuela, where Chavez has been the enormous subject of controversy, of, uh, called a populist. Let me put that in background. Venezuela is uh, the richest natural resource country in Latin America, enormous amount of oil resources, gas resources. Uh, and yet, and yet, two-thirds of the people still live in poverty. Most of the money from these natural resources are going to a small group of people at the top. They enjoyed it. And they wanted to fight to make sure they continue to do it. Chavez was, yes, elected as a populist, and his populism said that these are the people's resources and we want to make sure that they go to the people. We want to make sure that the money is spent to improve schools, health care, create jobs for the vast majority of the people of Venezuela. Whether he succeeds perfectly or not, of course, is, is, nobody is perfect and, and, and uh, it will be, take years for us to fully know. But what is already clear is that he has enormous support from the people in the barrios, in the poor areas, because he has actually begun to deliver in terms of education and health. Now, whether he's done it in a sustainable way, as I say, is whether it, we, we don't know. and uh, 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 It will take years for us to tell. But what is clear is that 
for the first time, somebody is paying attention to the well-being of some of the poorest people. There's also concern about whether he will be undermining democracy, um, whether he is keeping uh, uh, democratic processes uh, in play. Uh, and that obviously is, is, is a, serious, a serious concern. But what is also clear is that in the past, the media has not given voice, media controlled by a few rich people, have not given voice to the concerns of the poor. And what he is trying to do is to try to create media that reflect a broader spectrum of society. These are enormously complex matters, but what is clear is that the past has not worked. And what is clear is that something else needs to be done. And that is very strongly the sentiment in Bolivia. Even in the United States, the oil companies have tried to cheat the U.S. government and the Alaskan government. I was involved in one of the suits by the state of Alaska against the uh, uh, most of the, ma uh, the, the major oil companies that were doing business there, where they were supposed to pay to the state of Alaska a certain amount uh, based on what they received, net of their cost of transporting the oil from Prudhoe Bay, which is way in the north, down to the markets. What, it, what, they, what they thought is that they just cheated a little bit, a few pennies, on the cost and what they received, the government would never notice it. And a penny here and a penny there, and you're dealing with billions of barrels, you're beginning to talk about a lot of money. We discovered this complicated statistical analysis, enormous millions of dollars to actually detect it. But the state of Alaska sued, and the oil companies agreed to pay over a billion dollars of money that they had cheated from the state of Alaska. The same thing happened in the state of Alabama. I mention these because this is what happens with the oil companies dealing with highly sophisticated, well-functioning governmental institutions in the United States. You can imagine what must happen when they're dealing with governments that don't have the sophistication and too often, there's one other ingredient, which is corruption. It's cheaper to pay a government official a bribe of 10,000 or even 10 million than to pay the full market value for your oil. There is now a case pending, for instance, in Mobile in Kazakhstan. Uh, we don't know, of course, the outcome of, the, of that. But from what one has read from the media, it looks fairly clear. Of course, Exxon says, we don't know. We just paid the money to this guy who was supposed to facilitate the transaction. But obviously, when you're paying millions and millions of dollars, you weren't just buying the time of the facilitator. That money was going somewhere, and it was pretty clear where that money was going. So, this has been one of the real problems. It's not an accident that so many of the oil-rich countries or mineral resource-rich countries are undemocratic and corrupt. It takes two to tango, as we say. It takes two to have corruption, a briber and a bribee. And unfortunately, too often, the international companies have have seen the temptation and have given in. The result of all of these forces is that unfortunately we have what is called the natural resource curse, sometimes referred to as the paradox of plenty. You would have expected that countries with a rich endowment of natural resources would grow faster. They would be better off. But across the world, what we see is that countries with a large endowments of natural resources do not grow faster. 
What they do have is a superabundance of dictators and corrupt governments. And so rather than the money going to the growth of the economy, the well-being of the citizens, to the reduction of poverty, it goes to a few people at the top. And then the Western governments facilitate this in another way. Not only do they give it the money, but then they use that money to buy arms. Very lucrative arms trade. And that arms are used then to suppress the people. And then, so there's a vicious circle. You have the preservation of these dictatorship, the money and the arms sales together and the corruption lead to a continuation of situations where you have uh, undemocratic governments uh, where the money is not being used to promote economic growth and poverty reduction. If this were just one or two countries, you would say it's an exception. But the fact that it is so many is suggest that there is a pattern, a pattern that needs to be broken. There are things that can be done. We can make globalization work. We can, for instance, require the oil companies to disclose every payment they make. This initiative of transparency was one that BP actually tried to, to, to introduce in Angola. A Norwegian company called Hydro also tried to do it. These are companies that are committed to social responsibility, to trying to make globalization work. And so with the, they said, we're going to make sure that everybody knows how much we're giving the government. And if you know, so also know how much you sell, you can figure out what the price is and you can assess whether they're getting fair market value. The Angolan government said, no, if you do that, you're out of the country. We, there's sometimes an appeal to business secrecy. Well, what you know is when there's business secrecy, in this area, what well, this is really, there are no real legitimate arguments for secrecy. It is really an attempt to hide what is going on. Unfortunately, the United States has not set the best example here. U.S. policy in the area of natural, uh, the area of energy, set by the beginning of the Bush administration by a meeting where the government won't even disclose who was at the meeting. We know who it was. It was mostly energy executives. The proposals that came out of that were called, even by one of President Bush's own party, the bill that left no lobbyist behind. Everybody had their, had their, their as we say, they're their trying to feed at the trough to get more money from the government. But it wasn't addressing the country's energy needs. But this secrecy even goes to the point of, of the contracts that the government uh, often signs. Uh, there was a recent concern, why with oil prices and gas prices so high, why hasn't government revenues, U.S. government revenues from oil and gas increased commensurately? Obviously something very strange about the contracts, but the oil companies and gas companies have not made those contracts fully public. In the developing countries, the problem, of course, are in many cases even worse. So there is an international movement called transparency to try to make sure that they make transparent what, what they pay to the, to the countries. It would be very easy to force, government, to force the country, companies to do it. All you would have to have is the tax authorities and the United States, G7, other advanced industrial countries to say, if you don't disclose what you pay, you can't get a tax deduction. They would disclose it. Obviously, it's more valuable to, for them to have a tax deduction. So we need to move. We need to change the way globalization is managed. These are simple changes that can have an enormous change it would actually be promoting democracy. Another change is we need to discourage arms sales because these arms sales are what maintain these dictators in these countries. At the very least, 
we should make it more costly. We should tax these arms sales because these arms sales are what give rise to this enormous conflict, which has been probably the most important impediment to development in Sub-Saharan Africa. Economists call this an externality, a cost that the arms sailors don't bear, but the rest of society does bear. So there should be a tax on this. The revenue from the tax could actually be used to promote development. Uh, erased. Think of the following thought experiment. What would happen if we fully integrated, we had one big economy, and the economy worked in the way that well-functioning economies are supposed to work? Well, that would mean the wage is paid for skilled labor, wages paid for unskilled labor would be the same everywhere in the world. A person of a given skill would get the same compensation no matter where he worked. Of course, adjusted for some differences in climate or other local conditions. But that means that unskilled workers in the United States and Europe and in India and China would all get the same wage. It would be the average between the wages in Europe and the United, uh, the United States on the one hand and in the developing countries in India and China on the other. But with so many unskilled workers in India and China, it, the average would be closer to that of India and China. And that means that there's enormous downward pressure on wages and unskilled wages in the advanced industrial countries. This is what economic theory predicted. Now, it also explained that trade is a substitute for actually having one integrated economy. You don't actually have to migrate. If you can have the goods migrate, it's a substitute. So by producing, by buying goods made with unskilled labor in China or India, it reduces the demand for unskilled jobs in the United States and in Europe and that puts a downward pressure. And we've seen wage stagnation in the advanced industrial countries. The United States, people at the bottom have had stagnant wages basically for a quarter century. Real wages in the United States in the last five years have actually declined. The income of the median family, the person in the middle, has actually gone down in the last five years. So yes, the U.S. economy is growing, but most Americans are getting poorer. I see most. It's not just the poverty. It's not just the people at the bottom. It's the middle and down. So we are becoming countries, rich countries with poor people. Americans, Europeans, people in France rightly ask the question, how are we supposed to be, how is globalization supposed to benefit us if we are having lower wages and we have to respond by less job protections? The question is a good one. And the answer is, they are going to be made worse off. Only by making sure that the benefits of globalization are shared by everybody in society will we protect those at the middle at the bottom. What globalization, the theories of free trade, say is that the country as a whole may be better off. That the winners can compensate the losers. But it doesn't say they will. And if they don't, the losers are losers. Unfortunately, in the United States and to a regrettable extent in much of Western Europe, Rather than protecting the people at the bottom, we've been going in exactly the wrong direction. So the United States gave a tax cut, but the vast majority of the benefits of that tax cut went to the people at the very top, the people who had been the winners from globalization. The, loser, the losers from globalization got almost nothing. So it exacerbated the inequalities that globalization was already contributing towards. But it's even worse than that. Globalization has been asymmetric. I talked about the asymmetries between the advanced industrial countries and the developing countries. The fact that the advanced industrial countries impose tariffs 
that are four times higher on the developing countries than on other advanced industrial countries. But there's also an asymmetry between capital and labor. There's been a huge effort to liberalize capital. Very little effort to liberalize labor. And the result of this has been that the bargaining power of capital and labor have changed dramatically. If capital doesn't like what's going on in the country, if capital gets taxed, it says, I'll leave. I'll go somewhere else that they treat me better. But workers, particularly unskilled workers, have no choice. So this has meant that there is a strong force for reducing taxation on capital, and that puts enormous, it shifts the burden towards labor, and particularly unskilled labor, which is the least mobile. Moreover, the globalization agenda has put enormous pressure to cut taxes more generally. And as we've cut taxes more generally, that has meant that the kinds of services that government can provide, safety net expenditures, for everybody in society, and particularly for those who are adversely affected by globalization, have been reduced. So they've lost on that account as well. So while we should be doing everything we can to make sure that the benefits of globalization are shared widely, taken, the beneficiaries are the corporations who are doing very well and the people who have those very necessary skills for globalization, that we take some of the gains, the enormous gains they're getting, and share them, use some of the tax revenues to improve education, to make sure that more people get skills, we in fact have been doing just the opposite, leaving them the people who are losing, even more vulnerable. And the result of this is, it's not surprising, that globalization has, re has such a negative reaction. In the advanced industrial countries, these individuals perceive that they are losers, and they are losers. No amount of rhetoric saying that in the long run everybody will benefit will convince them. Keynes, the great uh, economist of the 20th century, had an expression. He said, in the long run, we're all dead. And the workers who see their job protections being reduced, their wages being reduced, their jobs being eliminated, feel very much the same way. And unless we put into place social policies, economic policies, that share the benefits more fairly, there will be, I believe, a backlash against globalization. One of the questions that I often get asked is, can we change globalization? I've described enormous number of problems with globalization, described the corporations as a major source of the problems of globalization. And the next natural question is, well, won't they stop any change? Why am I optimistic that we can make globalization work? There are a large number of reforms that could be, we could undertake to make it work better, but why do I think that they will, there will be any demand for these, and why will, do I, am I hopeful that they will be accepted? Well, in my mind, globalization has already produced too many winners for us to walk away from globalization. It has produced an enormous amount of benefits for those countries that have managed it well, like China, and for those who have been on the beneficiary side, like the United States and Europe. So it's too important for us to with, go back from globalization. On the other hand, there are too many losers from globalization as it has been managed for us to continue in the way we've, continued, we've, we've been going. If we don't do something, the backlash will be too strong. And therefore, in my mind, we have no option. We have to make globalization work. It is the only alternative. Now, there are, it's not going to be easy. I actually think it is in the interest of the advanced industrial countries 
to help create a fear of globalization and to create a globalization that works both for the advanced developed industrial countries and for the developing countries. Let me, let me explain some of the ways in which I think everybody can benefit if we restructure globalization and make it work in the way that I've described. One of the problems facing all the, uh, facing all the developed countries is enormous pressure on migration. That pressure on migration has both economic and social consequences. Difficulties of integrating these individuals into society, um, downward pressure on wages, a whole host of consequences. But these immigration pressures are the inevitable consequences of huge wage disparities. When I was in the Clinton administration, one of the reasons we supported NAFTA is because we believed that it would reduce the enormous gap, the six-fold gap in wages between the United States and Mexico. We thought it would bring, reduce that gap, and that by reducing that gap, it would reduce the migration pressure. But unfortunately, NAFTA did not live up to what we had hoped. The gap between Mexico and the United States in the first decade of, of, global, of, of NAFTA actually increased. And so the migration pressure has continued. And similar, similar forces are going on elsewhere uh, in the world. If we can make globalization work, it will mean increasing incomes in the developing countries. And that will reduce this migration pressure, which will be of enormous benefit, I think, to both the advanced industrial countries and to the developing countries. There are other reasons, I think, that we will all benefit from globalization. We don't know what causes terrorism. There are many different forces. But it is very clear that despair, the despair that comes from unemployment, lack of hope, that we see in so many of the developing countries provides a fertile feeding ground for terrorists, for suicide bombers, for, for those who see no future. And so I think that one of the ways that we can, can address this problem is by trying to, to really promote democracy and development in these countries. If more of the oil revenues went to the benefit of the people, and rather than to the dictators and to the oil companies, then I think there would be uh, a better outcomes, more security, more peace in the world as a whole. The most important reason, in my mind, for reshaping globalization is a moral reason. It is unconscionable for us to live in a world with these huge disparities where we have the resources, we have the technology, we have the means of reducing these inequalities, of doing something for the people living in desperate poverty. It's even worse when we take advantage of our economic power to increase that disparity, as we did in the World Great Round, the last round of trade negotiations, which made the poorest people in Africa even poorer. So rather than using our economic power in the way that we have that has made these disparities even greater, we should be using this in a way that reduces these disparities and reduces the number of people in the desperate poverty that we see in so much of the world today.